And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the, cur the currently in development Repent, the end times role-playing game. The one and only Sean Michael Lynn. How you do? How you doing today, man? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I'm do. I'm doing good. It's only a few months in. I I already missed the winter, and I'm not <laughs> looking forward to the summer. I see. <laughs> uh, so, a bit of a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings. So. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Uh, let's see. I think uh, I was probably about nine years old when I got um, the D&D Basic Box set. Red uh, box? My uh, yeah, the purple box with the green dragon on it, I believe. Um, okay, so that'd be BX. Okay, okay. Um... I got that when I was like nine, but I know it took me a good few years to figure it out and have the motivation to try to play it. Um, but uh, I, I, at the time, I was had just moved to uh, a farm in Michigan, about 400 acres. My parents are pretty strict. Um, they would let me explore a little bit, but only so far each year. But each year, I was allowed to explore further, and I had some aerial photos. And, of course, that's, you know, every boy's dream. Uh, there's a whole kingdom to explore, but you have to level up each year to get to it. <laughs> uh, so uh, it was probably about, I was maybe 14 or 15 when I decided to actually start trying to play Dungeons and & Dragons. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, it was like, hey, let's play at lunch in the school library. Well... In the 80s, that wasn't so hot with the school faculty. Um, so that they put a stop to that. Um, but during my early college years, uh, we started playing a pretty serious campaign, probably about six years' worth, um, until uh, I came back from school for a bit, and I decided I wanted to uh, just kind of wrap it up with something epic. And so that's where I decided to take a look at uh, Revelations in the Bible for something kind of into the world-ish. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of everything. Now, give, given, given that, <clears throat> one of the big questions that I, ha that I have, given the, given, what I've, given the origin you mentioned and, um, and the path to repent, were there... Mm -hmm. In the intervening years, were there any other ga were there any other games that you experimented with, or were you largely a D and D guy for the longest time? Uh, I was. I only probably seriously played D and D, um, but I picked up a number of other rule books over the years. Um, let's see, what did I get? Uh, GURPS and something obscure. What was it called? Uh, I'm trying to find it on my shelf. I don't have enough light here to see. Uh, kind of a <laughs> game but um and i, I did uh, experiment basing um what i learned from D, &D. I, I made probably a number of uh you know homebrew role-playing games pretty simple stuff um probably about a dozen uh, mm -hmm. of course being, being a, a gen x or um you know you had star wars as an influence dungeons and dragons and the cold war mm -hmm. uh so I did a lot of stuff with all the Vietnam movies that were to watch back then. Um, I did a lot of actual Vietnam role-playing games uh, for my brother and friends, cousins, so on and so forth. And give there's there um there have been there have been a fair there have been a fair, there have been a fair share of ga of games um, taking place in that era. One of the bit one of the big ones that comes to mind is um, Grunt. Mm -hmm. Um. But, give, but um, given the, given that, because the the reason why I asked that kind of thing is 
from the notes that I was able to see, and I realize that Repent is still in active development. Right. The thing that I, the kind of vibe I was reminded of the most is games like World of Darkness. Was okay. that was that an was that an influence or is that just coincidental on my observation? Um, it's probably more of a coincidence. I never played any of the World of Darkness stuff. I actually later on in life, when I was a video game designer, uh, worked on the um, uh, Hunter the Reckoning Redeemer for Xbox, mm-hmm. and then a, in a bit of time working on what was going to be a, a sequel to those titles. Um, mostly creating characters and working on like world faction stuff. Um, but no, I actually d- didn't use that as any kind of a, an influence or didn't, didn't play those during that time period. All right. It's, it, it's interesting. It's interesting. You mentioned, um, mentioned that, du- mentioned that duology because, because, well, I, well, obviously that, um, that was in the family of the old world of darkness. Um, and I'm and I'm vastly simplifying because trying to go into the various incarnations that World of Darkness has had over the years gets a little bit um, complicated. <laughs> but the but I but we'll get to we'll get to brass tacks on it. So what given now D and D has had, has had a very straightforward um, die system. You know D D twenty. Versus a difficulty that determines if you succeed or fail. Pray you don't yep. roll a one. Pray that you roll a twenty. All, all that yep. good stuff. Mm-hmm. What sort of die system are you using? Are you using a die? Are you using a die pool or are you using a straightforward result? Um, well, one of the things I should mention is in recent years I've started to get into Call of Cthulhu, seventh uh, edition, mm-hmm. and. Oops, um, and I, I didn't for repent. I just there's just no way that I could go with a, a class system, um, and so I was, I was really kind of taken in with a skill based system, um, kind of like what they they've done with Call of Cthulhu. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know I've got like a binder sitting over here for repent, full of uh, character sheets and skill lists from about as many games as I could find. Um, and there were some that were just, um, like, absurd as far as I'm concerned. You might as well have basket weaving as a skill. And I didn't want that on a character sheet. Um, but right now I'm using – I am using the full range, like, seven dice of, you know, D20. Mm-hmm. But uh, for most of the um, skill-based actions, it's it's the uh, percentile dice. And – um, when it com- so if if I'm hearing this right, there's there are certain types of rules that are going to be using d tw- a pool of d20s and certain types that will be using a um, percentile roll. Is that correct, or is everything using percentile? Um, most of your action skill checks basically will be percentile. Um, it's just that I can t- I use the rest of the dice for whatever you know for damage for um, you know for whatever el- other numbers I need to calculate. Mm-hmm. Which, I, in one way, I could see I could see that making sense since a d tw- since you're just dividing by five and de- ver- um, comparing the two. But when now the other reason I br- the other reason I bring up the, that approach, and since you've you've obviously seen this with with um, Call of Cthulhu, is. Mm-hmm. A lot of a lot of games in the in this sort in this sort of approach, whether it be horror, whether it be investigatory, or somewhere in between, um, rely on more of an archetype-based system. Um, Call of Cthulhu is the exception in this case. That one is pure freeform to the point where even your starting set of skills can be somewhat random. Mm-hmm. Um, so what what approach are you t- what approach are you taking? When it comes to the when it comes to the idea of archetypes within um, character creation, well, there's there's two things I've done. Um, in looking at most of the skill lists that I, that I um, I've researched, um, you know, the skill the name of the skill was actually you know what you did. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I did is I, I've 
ended up narrowing my skill list down to 24 skills. And they're actually, uh, the nomenclatures, the names I've used for them, are similar to what you would find in classes. So you have like an aviator skill, a fighter skill, a marksman skill, um, which I think, um, as far as the player is concerned, will help them create a player character that fits, I guess, the archetype that they're going for without actually being stuck in a class. Um, the Let's see, what's the other thing I was going to think of? No, I lost that thought. Oh, well. Don't worry. Don't worry. It'll come. It'll come back later, and you'll end up retroactively kicking yourself for it. That's how it works. <laughs> right. um, but that is an interesting setup because, in my experience, a lot of people look at skills as a um, as a one as a one note thing. A, the <laughs> skill does this one thing exclusively, and if it and if you and for something else, you'd need a different skill, which is right. why, especially in the '90s, you have those exhaustive skill lists. Of people trying to cover just about anything and everything, um, yep. and while Call while Call of Cthulhu has certainly has a large skill list, um, there are there are far worse offenders out there. Mm -hmm. um, the the big whipping boy for me when it comes to this kind kind of thing is the original um, Alien RPG, not the not the one that's currently out by Free League. That one's actually good, but the original, which <laughs> Um, had it, which had the, which had way too much fiddliness to the point where I outright refused to ever run it unless I'm sufficiently paid. Because <laughs> if I have to, if I have to, if I have to suffer through it, I'd at least like to get something out of that suffering. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> and the. And by do by having it in the, by having it in that kind of setup, and I'm guessing this is something you're going to be making clear in the writing, that each of these individual skills are multi-purpose, which absolutely yep. brings which brings me to another point. Mm -hmm. A common dichotomy in a lot of a lot of games that, especially games that are going with a narrative leaning, is a attribute plus attribute and skill um, dichotomy. <clears throat> Or the most the the most the the thing that has the most utility, but also the hardest to improve is attributes, and below below that is skills. And you're going to be adding be adding or calculating both when it comes to the um, die roll that you use. Is that approach used in this case, or are attributes and skills divorced from each other? They are related. I actually have um, since I have eight abilities. Or attributes um, I'm in 24 skills I've actually tried to assign it so that each skill has one of the eight um, so in a sense each ability has three skills that are paired to it oh uh, that makes <laughs> yeah and when now um when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to allocating between between attributes and skills, it I've seen some cases where the um, where you're allocating points, but you're allocating points for attributes and then for skills, or and in some cases it's all one it's all one big pile. Um, mm -hmm. Which of which of the two are you would you be going with with character creation, or are you taking a different route entirely? I'm um, not sure if I'm falling completely there. Um... You have um, you'll have points basically that you'll distribute to your abilities. Mm -hmm. um, skill points are going to be based on a number of other things as far as um, your intellect and your experience. Your, I'd say your life experience slash um, education level. Um, so that helps determine the points that you have available for skills. Mm -hmm. And. When it when it comes to when it given what you mentioned, um, are you planning on integrating some sort of life path mechanic when it comes to character creation? Um, yeah, can you elaborate on that? What you mean there? Um, a life a life path um system is, ge mm -hmm. is generally it generally is where um 
you you pick for you pick from you pick from either certain choices or or decide it ret or decide it randomly for say background early education continuing education relationships and so on the um the poster child for this sort of thing has been the life path system in the um ga in the games that use the interlock system um stuff like cyberpunk um mechton and most recently the witcher or most well, well okay most recently recently is cyberpunk red but you get my point okay uh no i don't have anything that's really tying everything together it's still pretty free form as far as being what you want to be or who you want to be character wise now we've talked we've talked about it now we we've already we've covered attributes and skills and i i know it's i know it's abilities in the thing it, so forgive me on this it's a case of old habits <laughs> that's fine um but when it but a lot of a lot of times there's there's always some, there's always some sort of x factor when it when it comes to when it comes to characters whether whether it be in whether it be in some form of ability that doesn't fit the attribute skill dichotomy sometimes it's some kind of extra effort pool sometimes it's a advantage disadvantage approach um a, you see this a lot, and you see this a lot in point by approaches like, say, the positives and negatives and GURPS. Um, what does repent have in the in this kind of category? Well, if I'm if I'm thinking about like, uh, I guess the negatives. There's a couple things here. Um, for each of the eight abilities, um, I'm currently kind of working out this system where, say, for strength, um, there's a little pool that you can accumulate called force which you can take from to boost a strength check mm -hmm. um on the kind of pros and cons you know pluses minus side um for this game um characters have um what are called strongholds and let's see i got one two three about 21 of those which are like vices um, they're things that your character has based on life experience slash age uh, that you start the game with, which are like your um, your faults, your flaws. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do have those. Now, when it, you already mentioned force, which co which covers the which for which um covers the extra effort end of things. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if now if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, the the um what the general vibe that you're going with repent is um is in the realm of supernatural horror, just u using the using um using revelations as as one of your primary, for lack of a better term, muses in this case. How yeah. is how is that how is that represented since? Plenty of a lot of games will represent horror in a lot of different ways. Okay. Um, uh, let me see how I would explain that. Um, t -t 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 -t. Well, some of it, I guess, would come down to, in addition to abilities, you know, most games they have hit points mm -hmm. and armor. But um, armor is not like an armor class thing at this point. It's really truly based on. Um, whether or not you're wearing anything the equivalent of body armor. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do have now what I call vitals, which are health, faith, grace, and spirit. Uh, and those break down into basically health is your life force or your hit points. Um, let's see. Let me scroll up a second here. Um, then I've got um, your faith, which is more like your spiritual health. Um, you could you know you could actually compare that probably uh, say in Call of Cthulhu to sanity, um, and then um, uh, grace, which um, you could compare in Call of Cthulhu to luck or in D and D to saving throws, um, and then spirit uh, you'd compare to uh, basically you know mana or magic points or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, as far as the horror elements, um, your faith um, basically can be whittled down by uh, supernatural attacks 
And when they when a supernatural attack um, occurs that reduces your faith, say if it knocks your faith down by five points, typically those five points, because uh, spiritual attacks tend to be uh, kind of demonic in origin, um, those transfer them. They take them from your faith and they stick them in one of your strongholds. So instead of just, a, you know, there's there's normal reactions to fear. I've got like a, a list of those. Mm-hmm. Um, but your strongholds, your character's weaknesses become exacerbated by things that um, make you question your faith. All right. Now, you mentioned, uh, now when it comes to... When it comes to um, grace, you compare. You compare. I believe you compared that to luck. Um, now, when when I've seen when I've seen luck when I've seen luck represented in in um in other instances, sometimes it's sometimes it's a resource they can you you can use to essentially do essentially do a mulligan or sometimes do a um edit in mm-hmm. um, in the narrative. Is is grace on is grace working on a similar level or is there something different to how it works yeah my current plan is it's it's working on a similar um concept uh, the idea of a, a pool that you can use from to modify a role um but you know as the the you know game host is is you know running things if they you know for whatever reason decide to make you uh, do a grace check um it's used in that capacity as well Oh, all right. And I'm get, I'm guessing that for each of the, when it comes to the idea of a grace check, is that done via D100? Yes. All right. Mm-hmm. Um. And since you already brought up hit points, that answers one of the questions I was going to have: is whether or not you had some sort of wound system, or, or um, do you have wound thresholds, for instance? Yeah. Let me scroll down here and take a peek at my wound <laughs> stuff. Um, is it here? Um, yeah, I've, I've basically got um, a whole bunch of stuff on that. Um, everything, uh, basically injury, injury severity, mm-hmm. um, ranging from uninjured to critical. Um, and each of those then can be uh, uh, positively influenced by uh, first aid, you know, different skills, um, let me see. Where's the next thing I'm looking at here, too? Um, and then the type of wounds for uh, things like, uh, you know, infection risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I've also got um, basically damage damage modifiers or multipliers based on wound location as well. All right. Now, when it comes... When... It when it comes to when it com- when it comes to the the core role the D, the D one hundred are you are you use are you utilizing your own your own equivalent of criticals um, i e if somebody roll if somebody rolls a one versus if somebody rolls a um, one hundred yeah I've got that I think it's um I think it's a like a three point range like one to three and ninety seven to hundred something like that mm-hmm. on the op um plus I've also uh, taken a cue from uh, call of Cthulhu for the way they've done their kind of difficulty matrix only instead of doing um, three tiers I've actually got five tiers so I've got like normal moderate hard extreme and impossible roles yeah um, no, I'm, gu- I'm guessing. I'm guessing that when it comes to that difficulty matrix, it's basic that the the baseline difficulty is whatever um, whatever stat you're test you're testing against, and the right. difficulty modifier, the difficulty tier in this case, just makes that deep that baseline lesser than what it normally would be. That's correct. All right. Um, now, when it now when it com- now um. In the, when it comes to critical when it comes to critical successes and failures, I'm not I'm not sure if that's the name you're going to use. I'm just using that because again, old habits. Um, mm-hmm. Is it a case of a autom- is it a automatic success or is it a case of a of a open roll? 
Um, that's, I think it's basically just an open role. Uh, it's, it's not something that I've fully detailed out yet. Um, at least I don't think I have. I have to, have to dig through all my stuff here. Um, I believe it's just an open role. Yeah. And for, for the record, what I mean by an open role is roll, roll again and then roll again and then, um, and then, st and then stack the results on what came before, i.e. explode, exploding dice. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I'm not doing anything like that now. Mm -hmm. Um, it, so, and, and given, given that, given that, um, what, what effects would, what effects would a critical, ha what a critical have in combat? Uh, let me see what I've got here. Um, t -t 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 um basically, uh, depending on what you're using, and now I haven't worked out everything in spiritual warfare yet, which mm -hmm. is kind of magic side of things um but with um physical weapons um it's basically um the basically the better the the better your role um if you're say you're 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 trying to hit whatever and you uh you actually get a uh, say you make an impossible role mm -hmm. you succeed so well it's basically i mean you call it a, a critical but it's you you succeed at an impossible level um with a i'll just pick one here uh, I'll pick a firearm um depending on the weapon and the and the kind of the way you're using it if you're doing a you know a rapid fire full auto burning a whole clip um it's going to determine how many bullets are hitting and at what distance um, I've actually got a system for location hits for wound locations that basically, let me see if I can bring that up real quick. It's uh, it ass assigns a certain dice for your hit locations based on the skill at which you fired. So if you're totally just spraying wildly, you might roll the d20 and that'll determine where your bullets go. But if you're really, um, you're really focused uh, that roll would be with a D4. So you're hitting like center of mass, head, neck, torso, abdomen. Um, that's kind of my approach at this point. All right. That ma that makes sense. Um, and speaking of, speaking of, um, of, ma of, um, magic. Um, now there, there's in Call of Cthulhu, there's been, there's been a small host of spells that, and all, and in order to, maintain its themes a lot of them are very are very ritualistic and very high and very very high risk because mm -hmm. i think i think just about all of them are going are going to are going to result in some degree of sand loss um talk to me about the the uh, me the the method that the that the for lack of a, that the um i believe you said faith pool would be would be utilized in supernatural effects by players to maintain to maintain um, repents um, themes. Okay, well, let's see. Basically, um, and I think I'm not sure if I've got everything here in front of me, but um, you've got uh, at the most powerful end um, spiritual gifts, which are kind of like supernatural skills mm -hmm. um, that uh, characters can have. And um, they can be anything from uh, various types of what I would call miracles in the game to um, uh, performing exorcisms. Um, and then you move on to uh, prayers, which are more, um, which don't require skill, so to speak, when they have uh, more limited effects. But um, everything in the game, especially in combat, takes time. So you're, you've, you've got your choice. You're going to, you know, shoot <laughs> if you've got ammo. Um, or if you don't, maybe you're going to pray and try to influence combat through that. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. No, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just kind of thinking, I kind of think I referenced before um, that uh, the spirit uh, vital is kind of like your... Um, I guess your mana pool for uh, doing these various supernatural things. All right. Now, some now 
a lot of games will have will have their own particular um, avenue of some sort of some sort of special rule setup. Um, mm-hmm. I've already mentioned what I've already mentioned World of Darkness, and that can have next some some games call it talent. Some um, D and D had proficiencies back in second edition, and then fe- and then um, feats in mm-hmm. thir- in third edition onward. Um, does repent have anything like this? Or is or is the dichotomy strictly the dichotomy on the sheet strictly um, abilities, skills, and equipment? It's pretty much um, ability, skills, equipment, you know, and then all of the the, the supernatural side of things, the spiritual mm-hmm. gifts, prayers. Um, I don't, I I, did, I didn't feel like I really wanted someone to say, you know what, out of all the firearms, I really want to put special attention to this particular one i you know people can say hey this is my favorite weapon but i didn't want to make it part of the the rules all right i get i can get i can i can definitely get that um now you meant you mentioned a time factor when it came to combat um that brings Mm -hmm. me to the idea of of um action economy in in combat and is it a case where everybody has a set number of actions, or are you doing um, a case where a action results in some sort of time penalty before someone can act again? Uh, I basically am, am giving, I'm probably borrowing more from D&D on that side and saying that a, a combat turn, you know, is about six seconds or so. Mm-hmm. So I've broken everything down in terms of uh, actions during combat into um, a full action, a half action, or a quick action. So you can do one full action, uh, two half actions, three quick actions, or a half and a quick. Mm-hmm. And when and I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing that you've got a short list of what of what qualifies as e- as each. So in that in that regard, in combat, what would be some examples? Of a full action, a half action, and a quick action. Okay, uh, let me see if I've got here. Combat action examples. Um, so full actions. Um, let's see. A full action would say give you a semi-auto or single shot aimed attack. Mm-hmm. So you're actually taking your time to aim the shot. Um, at the moment, I've also got prayer as a full action, um, or say mm, reloading a crossbow. Um, for a half action, um, you'd be taking like a normal shot, um, or a short burst, depending if it was a fully automatic weapon, mm-hmm. um, or, um, say starting a vehicle might be a half an action. Um, and for quick actions, uh, that would be a snapshot or hitch, hip shot, um, a basic melee attack, meaning you're not doing anything special. It's not martial arts. You're pretty much just punching somebody as quick as you can. Mm-hmm. Kind of a miniatures take. top game over the years um it's kind of always well, I, been one <laughs> yeah I, I, I suppose i suppose um but um uh, what was i gonna say um there's i suppose there's a part of me though the kind of the logic side that um you know has worked out things as far as you know weapon ranges and and so forth so you know, if you want to, if you want to play on a grid, you probably can. I mean, I'm, I'm keeping track of things like that. So now, when it comes now, 
one of the things that I one of the things that I saw that I found in, that I found interesting when I was when I was doing my own research is mm -hmm. a part of character creation that it, that I believe is a character's church and obviously trying to cover every denomination would um, would make the book way too damn long. Um, right. <laughs> like you'd, you'd end up you'd end up having a book as long as I'm tall and mm -hmm. I am not a short man so <laughs> that's mm -hmm. not gonna, that's not going to be feasible. Um so I'd li I'd like to talk I'd like to talk about what what inspired that particular avenue and how the choice of one's ch um church um plays out, plays out when it comes to the rest of the mechanics if at all. Okay, okay. Yeah, well I think I mean, you know, realistically you know, there's a lot of people out there in, you know, in the Christian world that, you know, maybe they have their beliefs and they've got their Bible, but they've moved from church to church and they don't necessarily know what denomination they are. <laughs> um, plus, there are so many different denominations, let alone, you know, Catholic Church versus Protestant and so forth. Um, I decided that I would actually take the very opening part of the book of Revelations, which I believe describes uh, the state of the church in the end times by having uh, um, John's messages, John the Revelator's messages to the seven churches be the basis for part of character creation that defines kind of like your church influences. Uh, and that's what I'm calling at this point, I'm calling church spirit. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and I'd have to actually scroll up here to look at my full list because I don't memorize them. Um, but I've got, uh, basically the churches are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laod Laodicea, um, which are fairly interestingly described in the book of Revelations as the fallen church, the persecuted church, um, the uh, liberal church, the false church, the dead church, the faithful church, and the prosperous church. Um, so, it's not saying that, hey, I'm that's the church I go to. It's saying these are my influences. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a backstory thing for your character. And I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing that you have plans on putting it aside to make that clear that this that it isn't necessarily denoting your a, a character's particular faith, but more of influence. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that's something I could easily see getting um, construed. <laughs> Sure, sure. Al along with some, along with some people making bad jokes because one of them is named Fi one of them is named Philadelphia, um, right, right. Because meme magic is real. <laughs> but would when it when it comes to the when it comes to the choice of that does that does that influence the the amount of points that a that a um character would have in in um, certain avenues or is it mainly a narrativist choice um, I'm actually making that have a slight effect on things it um, it affects each of the churches affects um, three of your strongholds and um, gives you a bonus to uh, three prayers and a um, a starting gift now this is still fairly early in development so I may mm -hmm. change some of it um, but I did make them have um, a bit more influence. It doesn't. It doesn't define what you do as a as a person or as a character like a class would. Mm -hmm. But it has it has an influence on the supernatural aspects of your character. It's an archetype. Yeah. Um, that and that was that was that was the reason why I brought up um, ar archetypes in the past because. I'll use I'll use va I'll use vampire as as an example for this kind of thing since everybody knows memetically in one form or another about vampire. Um, not every not every be, if someone if someone is sired into clan um, Gangrel, mm -hmm. that, that doesn't that doesn't mean that they're all going to be using the exact same abilities, but they're but multiple gangrel will will be akin to a Venn diagram where there are certain abilities that they're go that they're going to have a bit of a leaning to but not the not um be the be all end all of what they can do. Right, right. And yeah, it gives you a slight bump 
in the beginning, but you're not limited mm -hmm. at all. Now, there's no, it's not like, you know, you're, you're a mage and you can't wear armor or something like that. No. Um, I think, and in, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, when it comes to, when it comes to clan, when it comes to um, clan gifts and something like vampire, and I think the same would apply with the church gifts in your, in your case, there's, the, there's this one thing that they have, ex that they have exclusively that the others don't. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, when it comes now, when it comes to encounters, and this is this is always the thing that is a very scub issue for for a lot of folk. Um, how is how is it that we talk, we've talked a bit we've talked a bit about the horror aspect, but how do you, how do you main, how do you maintain the sca the um, fear factor for for lack of a better term when it comes to the supernatural encounters and what kind of advice would you give G would you give GMs um, trying to make sure that the that there that there is a that there is a element of scariness with repent? Well, I think I mean as far as I, I guess I, I refer to repent as you know I guess I would say you know kind of survival horror because there's definitely a, a survival element which you know is everything from dealing with, you know, a pack of wild dogs to, you know, military police to, um, you know, on the more horror end of things, demons. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's going to be um, partly defined by... Uh, actually, can we take a break a second? Um, yes, hold, hold on a sec. Oh. We've danced we've danced around a bit when it comes to when it comes to divine gifts and and um prayers and I'd let and I realize that this is something that's in flux but could you give me a, a, exa a example of each just just to pr just to present what what um someone would be working with in that regard Sure I can probably give you just a, a few of each just so you can see the difference because they're pretty pretty different mm -hmm. um uh, for spiritual gifts, um, it could be anything from, um, uh, golly, the ability to um, prophesy, um, have dreams, and see events before they take place, um, or um, the ability to cast out demons, you know, the exorcism. Um, at least that's what I'm calling it for now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there's actually one that I call Herald which is um, the uh, kind of the ability to manifest a, a um, guardian angel. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the spiritual gifts. They're mostly based on spiritual gifts that are outlined in the Bible and or um, references to specific types of miracles um, as a category, so to speak. Um, with prayers, I actually did some research and I found a, a list of about yeah, three hundred different kind, different prayers uh, mentioned in the Bible, um, uh, and they weren't actual like you know like a prayer, like a poem, but an actual a reference to a character in the Bible, um, a person in the Bible uh, praying for something. Um, and then I took that list and I condensed it into eh, twenty four, twenty twenty one, something like that. Um, uh, prayers that were were common throughout. So that list of th 300 became 24 because people were praying for the same thing throughout the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, for prayers, it's, you know, they're more like, you know, things that you uh, kind of like situations in which you pray. So you can have a prayer, a prayer for in combat, um, a prayer for in death, um, prayer, um, um, t t t prayers for victory, prayers for you know, revelation. You like you're totally at a loss for what to do, and you need you know like divine inspiration, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Um, since you mentioned guardian angel, I'd I'd be rem and give, given um given a game that I co that I covered in this in a previous interview, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. When it comes to the appear the appearance of angels, I'm get. I'm guessing you are not going with the, with the typical um, guy, the typical guy with wings, but more of the be not afraid approach. 
Yeah, there was a uh, there was a video, and I can't remember. There was a series, a video series I watched a while back. Uh, I think it was called The Days of Noah, mm-hmm. and they had this uh, they had this one scene that was so cool, where these uh, bad guys or whatever with guns were chasing this woman through the woods, and she ended up backed in a corner against a, a, a rock outcropping, and as they came around the corner, they saw her. But when they looked up on top of the rock outcoming outcrop, um, they they saw a special forces team. Mm-hmm. And so they like, they put their hands up and they backed off. And after, it, it takes a second when you're watching it to realize that those were angels. Yeah, they were actually appearing as special forces to intimidate the other guys. Um, so, yeah, throughout the spiritual uh supernatural side of things and repent i really want to leave that open to uh creative use Mm -hmm. as opposed to just dictating and and certainly no i i I don't i don't want you know a guy with wings to show up and you know unless the uh game host thinks that that's something that he wants to do um it's not something that i i'm not going to have a a picture of an angel with um with white wings and a halo and a flaming sword in, in the book, no. I um, personally, I've I've always I've always been more um, I've always leaned more towards, ain't towards the idea towards the idea in in narratively speaking, having having angels need to take disguises because if they if they show up with if they show up in a natural state, then the people that they're supposed to help tend to <laughs> go crazy from the revelation. You know, taking yeah. that whole line from dogma that. Oh, Metatron has to be the voice of God because if God speaks for himself, then you'd probably end up exploding. Right. Yep. No, even for most of the stuff, especially things like the the demons in the game, um, my my influences, I guess. Uh, I mean, I started out as an artist. I went to school for film and video. Mm-hmm. I became an animator and and all that. And got into video games and and fell in love with design and writing. Um, but I always liked um, uh, the the way Alfred Hitchcock did things in film um, and H.P. Lovecraft in, in fiction um, because it was it was about fear of the unknown mm-hmm. and and it's you know giving a, a glimpse or a silhouette was so much better than you know the full color you know light shining on whatever the heck it was it was supposed to be scary. Um, yeah. So, and the same same goes with the supernatural stuff. I really, you know, if a if a character is a praying or you know, it's interesting because I think there will be a lot of situations where a character, uh, a player character, is praying for some kind of action, you know, some kind of divine, um, you know, intercession. But it will be left up to the game host to determine how that manifests itself. So unlike a typical spell, say in you know a fantasy game D and D or whatever, where it defines exactly what happens and and what it looks like, um, this will be something that could be unexpected. It can it can offer uh, story twists um, in how exactly you get the help that you want. Taking the taking that into taking that into, and I think the I think the other advantage with the, with doing that approach is. Being able to being able to maintain the feel without without having to rely on the DM or the players having read through revelations at the at the same extent. Mm-hmm. Um, but that brings me to the um com- the question of a bestiary. Now, mm-hmm. in one form or another, a lot a lot of games are a lot of games are going to have one. And given given that you're dealing with um. Without with with supernatural allies and enemies that don't necessarily have to take the same shape all the time, um, mm. how do how do you maintain that mystery when having a when having a um, bestiary chapter within the book? Well, let's see. I haven't I haven't gotten very far when it comes to the allies, so to speak, like in any anything to do with angels. I've I've done some research into. Uh, roughly, you know, nine types of angels from, you know, the Bible and a couple other uh, like apocryphal texts and, and uh, 
Jewish texts, um, you know, which is, you, you know, seraphim, malachim, ophanim, all these different, you know, uh, Jewish terms for mm -hmm. angel. Um, but when I took and started working on demons, because I really needed spiritual enemies to work with to start working on um, spiritual warfare, um, I took I took basically those types of angels and I imagined them as just the complete absence of anything light and good, holy. They're like if you know if matter is one thing, well then demons are antimatter. Um, and so I've the the, the demons uh, in the game in particular are um, they're not only based on scripture, uh, but based on some research I've done with, uh, uh, Vatican exorcists and, um, and even the, th uh, the kind of things that you see in, um, you know, supernatural reality television, mm -hmm. um, and, or reading, I've read some books by, um, Ed and Lorraine Warren, a uh, famous demonologist. Um, and really when you start to put them together, I mean, you end up with, not with just like a powerful, creature like a dragon or a Tarrasque or whatever from D&D, &D, but you end up with a creature that is so capable of changing the definition of what it is that it becomes powerful. Mm -hmm. How they appear, how they play with you, mess with you, influence you, um, they're, they're really, you know, they're really scary. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, and I'm guessing I'm guessing that you have a um, that when it comes to like you mentioned spiritual warfare a, a few times and something I'm curious about because I've I've seen this in I've seen this in other games is mm -hmm. spirit is when it comes to spiritual warfare and spirit and essentially spiritual combat is that a whole other subsystem uh compared to compared to regular combat or not I'm really working on it not being separate. I want it to be something that it, you know it's it's all happening you know at the same time not uh, not you know because i I can't have a i mean I realistically can't have a situation where um, you have to as the game host or whatever um, say well i'm gonna have either a you know physical combat encounter or a spiritual combat encounter. Um, there has to be room for both to happen simultaneously. And I can I can definitely see that because I I ended up thinking of the physical and social combat I've seen I've seen how in some games how those two are um, separate pillars. Um, and while there's while there's nothing wrong with that, ide ideally it's best to have it's best to have a degree of unification because mm -hmm. the the whole the whole series of subsystems thing is is something that um has not hold, has not held up with age. <laughs> like you look at a lot you look at a lot of RPG design and you're going to see a all roads lead to Rome kind of mentality. Um, mm -hmm. Old school Renaissance aside, obviously. But taking but with all with all that said, now I know that this is that this is bit that this has been in a active development and you have a fairly healthy um playtest group but what but what would you be shoot what would you be shooting for as far as not a release window but a window so that people could get a like say a quick start version of it before a before a full release yeah um <laughs> let's see here um i definitely i definitely want to be able to to do it release it in that way where I have a, you know, a, a quick start simplified version, you know, and then a PDF and, and, and hardcover book for people who want that. Mm -hmm. want to go that as far as, um, uh, release. It's like, I, I, I keep thinking at this point that I'm really in, I'm in a close pre alpha. I'm almost to the point where I'm going to have enough in there. Um, to begin play testing, but I've still, I've still got some work to do. Um, so as far as a window, that's hard to say. I, I would hope in the, within the next year, 
um, hopefully sooner than that. But uh, I've definitely got some work to do yet. Which I'll I'll certainly be I'll certainly be looking forward to to that kind of setup. And obviously, since since a lot of it um, falls into this purview, have you have you considered doing some sort of crowdfund when the time comes? Yeah, that's. Um, I mean, I've, I'm playing around now. You know, it's not really any success on with Patreon because I've seen that used a couple times. But my, the real plan is to to get a enough of a following and support uh, backers to do a Kickstarter. Um, I don't necessarily need to do a Kickstarter, but I would love to do a Kickstarter so that I can put together um, a hardcover book with. Uh, the kind of quality art that I would like to have. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, networking, I'm networking on that side as well, um, getting together with some artists, and um, you know, I've already touched base with uh, Drive Through RPG a little bit, and um, and then just trying to get the word out there, and you know, see who's interested, and in, uh, you know, assemble the team, so to speak. As far as assembling the team, that's perfectly fine. But for but for the love of all that is holy, I do not want to see you in a Captain America outfit. Not gonna happen. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you want to go, now if you want to go as John Constantine, I'm, per, I'm not gonna stop you there. Okay, all right. Um, I might be able. To... But with but with all that said i do i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy and um sh and share what you're working on in the in this little hub of insanity we call the monastery well thank you and anytime you see fit to return whether it's a, whether it's further development or or just to or just to laugh at the dice gods making us all suffer um, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will definitely, I will definitely be coming back. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!